Hello, health champions. How is it that Mexicans and other Latino populations in Central America and South America have relied on corn for their main staple as their entire foundation for their existence for thousands of years and not developed any significant health problems? And yet, in the last few decades, the rates of obesity and diabetes have soared. Today I want to give you the skinny and the fat on corn and what it does to your body. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Ekberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video. As I'm sure you're aware, obesity is epidemic all around the world. Apart from a few Pacific islands where the rates are just astronomical, if we only count larger countries, today Mexico unfortunately is the number one in adult obesity according to some recent estimates. They have surpassed even the United States today. And they're also number one in childhood obesity. So among adults, we now have eight out of 10 people being overweight, 44% of people are obese. And if you've been watching this channel, you know that storage of fat is linked to insulin and insulin resistance is pretty much synonymous with type two diabetes, severe insulin resistance. So therefore there's also no surprise that Mexico is one of the leading countries in adult type 2 diabetes with over 15% of adults. So a lot of the blame has been put on corn, that these cultures, they eat so much corn and corn is a starch and it's sugar and it's all this stuff, but they've done so for tens of thousands of years without developing any significant problems. So does it have carbs? Yes, absolutely. Is it a problem? Yes. But we can't look at just a single factor and put all the blame on it. So let's take a look at the bigger picture. According to official sources, they're as usual very quick to lay the blame on the usual stuff. They're saying they eat too many calories, they've increased their fat, they eat more meat, they eat more sugar, more processed foods, and they have decreased their activity. And all of these things are true, but which ones are truly relevant? Well, the fact that they're eating more calories is not really relevant. The question is, why are they eating more calories? And we'll come back to that one a little bit. Are they eating more fat? Yes, but fat does not stimulate insulin. So unless you eat a lot of sugar and carbs together with the fat, the fat is not the problem. It's focusing on the wrong thing. Meat also, is very satisfying. It helps you eat less by keeping you full and it does not stimulate a lot of insulin, not nearly as much as carbohydrates. So that's not it either. And these three things typically get a lot of blame, but they're not the ones to blame because these things help people lose weight when they eat the right kinds. However, they're absolutely right in sugar and they're absolutely right in processed foods because both of those will dramatically increase insulin production and insulin resistance and also they will make you eat more calories. So these are the primary things to blame. So what about physical activity? Does that matter? If you watch some of my videos, you hear me say that activity, exercise is not significant in reversing a fatty liver and insulin resistance. But physical activity is huge in preventing the development of insulin resistance because a working muscle uses up glucose and carbohydrate without the need for much insulin. It's like it's sucking the glucose and carbs out of the system and turns it into energy for labor, for activity. And in doing that, it keeps a lot of the congestion out of the liver. So it's huge in preventing insulin resistance, 
but it's not significant in reversing it because once the fat is in the liver, it can't do much to pull it out of there. But it does get a big green check mark that it was a significant factor. But here's what's really going on. When we look at the income, the gross domestic product per person in the 60s was less than $500. In the 70s, it was over 1,000. In the 80s, it was over 2,000. 90s was over 4. In the 2000s, it was over 8,000. And in the 2010s and on, it was about $10,000 per person. So what this means is that up through 1960, when they were all skinny and ate a lot of corn, they were basically just fighting to eat enough food to survive. And that was the same with a lot of different countries in the world, that this is the primary driving factor in obesity because once people stop fighting for survival and they get some money, now they start eating junk because that's a part of affluence, unfortunately. Before we learn what that stuff really does, it's a sign of affluence and luxury. So they started increasing processed foods, they started increasing sugar. A couple of years ago, Mexico was the number one consumer of soft drinks in the world per capita. Uh, now they've dropped back to third place or something like that, but they drink an enormous amount of sugar. They change in society with moving away from physical labor, obviously is true. Now the corn didn't really change. The culture, Mexican culture, Latino culture still consumes and did consume about 40% of their calories from corn. So that's still there, but it was together with the processed food and the sugar that it turned into a problem. Have they increased their calories? Yes, absolutely. Probably by five, six, seven hundred calories per day per person, but that's not the right question. The question is, why do they feel the need to eat more? And it is because the processed food and the sugar makes you hungry for two different very powerful reasons. The first reason is that both of these stimulate insulin. They drive blood sugar, they stimulate insulin. Insulin stores away the excess. Now you can't get to it, so you get hungry and you eat more. The other reason is that processed food and sugar are completely depleted. They have no nutrients. So you're packing a lot of fuel into the body, but you're not providing any micronutrients. So your body still feel like it's missing, it's lacking what it was looking for in the food. And therefore it says, go eat more because we still didn't get the things that we were looking for. And another factor is genetics. Even though genetics didn't cause this in the sense that they had the same genetics when they were skinny as they do now, you can still have a genetic predisposition that makes it more likely for you to develop diabetes than another population once you start eating this junk. So for some populations, they might have a 5% diabetes rate and other populations might have a 15 or 20% diabetes rate. So there is a genetic predisposition, but the genetics are not causing it. The genetics predisposes you to become obese and diabetic once you start eating the processed foods. But let's take a closer look at corn to understand more about what it is and what it does. It's the number one crop in the world and 90% of it today is GMO together with soybeans. It is virtually all GMO, which is why it's so important that you get organic so that you get a truer food, so you get more of an original food source. The Latinos for thousands of years certainly were not eating the GMOs. So there's more corn grown than there is wheat or rice or anything else in the world. 44.7 billion bushels and a bushel is 56 pounds or 25 kilos. So if you multiply that out, that's two and a half trillion pounds or 1.14 trillion kilos, 320 pounds per person, 146 kilograms of corn per person in the whole world. 
And then, of course, the U.S. tops the list at 2,087 pounds per person, almost a metric ton of corn per person, 948 kilos. So nobody obviously can eat that much corn. So where does it go? Well, 40% goes into ethanol. That's your car fuel. It's mixed in with the gasoline. And 36% goes to animal feed. So a big reason that they're not doing more grass-fed and naturally raised animals is that, well, someone has to eat all this corn. So that's why they're kind of perpetuating these horrendous animal factories and that, that's a way to basically get rid of the corn. And then 12% goes into human consumption is some shape or form. The vast majority of this goes into high fructose corn syrup, which is obviously the sweetener of choice for the last few years where it goes into a majority of processed food products. But corn is also used for cornstarch and maltodextrins and all sorts of other derivatives. There's hundreds and hundreds of different products that they use corn for and they all find their way into the processed foods. Have you heard the saying, you are what you eat? Well, let's take a closer look at this because this is fascinating to me. The Mexicans, Latinos, are often called the people of the corn because there's so much in their lifestyle that is around corn. I'm going to get just a little technical, but don't worry about it. It's going to all come together. Corn binds four carbons at a time. It metabolizes carbon differently. Virtually all of the carbohydrate in plants come from carbon dioxide in the air. And while most plants take in three carbons at a time, corn takes in four carbons at a time. So it's more efficient. It can bind more carbon per unit of time, per unit of water consumed than other plants. And that's why it's been so great at surviving and why it is so gratifying and so plentiful to grow and harvest it. One more thing that happens when it does this, it takes in more carbon-13 isotope. And what this means is, don't worry about it, but it means we can go back and measure in our body tissues and in the foods, we can measure how much of this food, how much of our tissues are coming from corn. And in the book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, Michael Pollan had access to a scientist who could measure this. So he collected some food from some fast food restaurants and he sent it to the lab. And here is what he found. The soft drink that you drink, that becomes part of your body, is 100% corn. The meat patty that you eat, that you think of as meat, is 93% corn. And the milkshake was 78% corn. The dressing was 65% corn. The chicken nuggets, 56% corn. The cheeseburger overall, when you mix in all of the dressings and the bread, was still 52% corn. And there was nothing in there that you think was corn, but the isotope analysis doesn't lie. This is where it comes from. French fries even were 23% corn. So when they analyzed hair samples, they found that about 70% of the human body was corn when you eat this stuff, which is way, way, way more than are in the bodies of Mexican people. So when we say people of the corn, what your body is actually made of, then the U.S. population has more corn. They are truly people of the corn, whether they ever eat the stuff or not. So the question becomes, are you corn fed? Are you corn? And why does it matter? Because corn fed animals are basically insulin resistant. It's not their natural food, just like sugar isn't natural to humans and they become insulin resistant. The marbling and the excess fat in their tissues 
is basically insulin resistance. It's congestion. It's an unnatural state. And if you eat a grass-fed, a, a cow in balance, it's going to have about a one-to-one -one ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory or neutral and omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. And if you eat grass-fed beef that is healthy and balanced, you're going to remain in balance. But if you eat corn-fed beef, it's going to have as much as a 20 to 1 ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 instead of a 1 to 1 ratio. So that makes it pro-inflammatory. And this inflammation is part of what's causing degeneration and degenerative disease and metabolic syndrome and so forth. So the significance of this is that if your body mostly consists of corn because you eat that stuff, then you are basically going to be predisposed and well on your way to this inflammation and this metabolic syndrome. Does that mean that you should never eat corn-fed beef? No, it means you do the best you can. I understand that people are on different budgets, they have different means, they start at different places in their journey. So if you have access and you can afford it, then grass-fed beef is going to be the best one. If you have to eat corn-fed beef and chicken, you're still way, way better off than eating these other worse forms. So if you're going to eat corn itself, then organic corn is going to be way, way better than GMO corn, which is going to be way better than corn starch. And of course, the worst of this is what we consume most of our corn today is as high fructose corn syrup. So these are not necessarily in this order because they affect us differently, but you get the general idea that this is the best end of the spectrum and this is the worst end of the spectrum. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to learn more about how to get truly healthy, you really need to check out that one next. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.